All right. G'day, guys. Uh, let's kick this off. Thanks for having a long lunch. Um, please don't fall asleep. I hope you didn't eat too much. We have a big session ahead. Uh, we're going to be talking about what's new in Visual Studio 2015 and the ALM stack and ASP and lots of other cool tips and tricks. Um, who has got a Surface 3? Surface 3. Big hands, because I can barely see you. Okay, there's quite a few. Okay. Um, who's got a Surface 4? You can put both hands up so I can see you. Okay. All right, there's just a couple of show-offs. All right. Well, this is my very first presentation on a Surface Book. Oh, I'm not impressed. All right. This is going to be hard. All right. <laughs> I was very, you know, I had to line up for two days to get into the shop, but uh, no, I didn't. I just went straight to the front of the queue and um, managed to get one, so it was awesome. All right, so uh, what we're going to do is going to do a trip down memory lane before, but before that, um, my name is Adam Cogan. I'm the Chief Architect at SSW. We are Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. Um, we're a gold partner. I am a Microsoft Regional Director and an MVP, and what the MVP does is it gives me some special information which I will use to my advantage near the end. Okay, so I'm a scrum coach and a soccer coach. Um, I did want to tell you that I discovered something in the last year. There is something worse than an Apple fanboy. Does anyone know, is there any Apple fanboys here? There isn't, is there? Oh God, there is. Okay, well there is something worse than an Apple fanboy who spends a few grand on, on Apple products. It is a Tesla fanboy who will spend $100,000 on a car, and I know because I put up a video and I got about 100 hate emails about, because I put all these uh, things about what is wrong with the Tesla. But I've gone and fixed them all and my Tesla is working perfectly now. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about um, uh, a little bit of history. I love, I've been doing this session for Microsoft since 2000 and one, their, their launch in the beta, and I always do this history slide, although it's getting a bit older, I guess, now. Who's seen this before? Oh, hardly anyone. All right, good. <laughs> 2002, we don't use anything. 2003, all we care about is uh, ReSharper. 2005, well, we care about generics. We still need that. TFS came out. 2008, uh, Link, we still care about. MVC was more important than we expected, and LinkPad by Joseph Albahari. The Aussie. He's not here, is he? No. All right. 2010, we got uh, IntelliTrays, MVC 2 and 3, and we got Test Manager. And that was the start of uh, integrating testing testers and developers. 2012, well, um, gee, they really pissed us off with the colors. Uh, we got fast ad references. NuGet was way more important than we thought. New the new Team Explorer without the dialogues popping up everything, everywhere was great. Uh, we got MVC 3 and 4 and exploratory testing, which I think is super important. And we got some third-party products like Octopus and InRelease. And Microsoft went and bought InRelease. Okay, so who's here on Octopus? Come on, H show of hands. Okay, all right, stand up if you're on Octopus. Okay, stand up if you're on Octopus. Because if you don't have your continuous deployment story sorted out by now, these are the people, you should be proud, stand up. These are the people you should be uh, aiming for. If you don't have Octopus or uh, InRelease or, or you, you know, a whole lot of uh, scripts, then you need to sort that out. Okay, one of the features that we got back then that still isn't used, unfortunately, is storyboarding. Okay, the stats from Microsoft show it's not uh, super popular, but there is a reason that it wasn't initially, and that is because uh, you had to, uh, I think it was in some premium license or ultimate, I can't remember. But anyway, it's now just in the base license and it's free, so it's good. All right, uh, 2013, we got uh, visualstudio.com, uh, also known as VSO. We got Visual Studio Community, uh, a good version with uh, extensions and stuff. We got TypeScript, super important and uh, code lens, okay, lots of cool stuff. Um, I'm sure, I'm trying to remember what they did to annoy us in this one. Okay, anyway, 
So, um, there is a thing that uh, the stats show that aren't being used very much, and that's browser link. That's a real shame, because you should have multiple browser, browsers set up, multiple um, uh, laptops, and you can make a change here and see it straight away. And especially for designers doing CSS changes, they waste a lot of time just by making a change, building F5, etc. Okay, so you should be using that. All right, we've had that for a while. There is also um, a tool from Mads, and I believe, is Mads here this week? No, okay. All right, well, he should be coming to Australia. That is ridiculous, Mads. Just tweet Mads and tell him he should be coming to Australia. Um, but anyway, uh, we have this browser link thing, and you should be installing that guy. You can uh, inspect your uh, code, goes right down to Razor, and it potentially gets even better when you're making changes here. You can come in here, press F12, and uh, it can go back to um, your source code. Now, I have tried to get some of the devs in SSW to be doing this, and one of the guys uh, sent me this video when I asked him to do it, and he said, <laughs> he's not gonna work that way because it's like that. <laughs> yes, very humorous. All right, so even if you're, you don't like working backwards, you um, still have a reason to have that. You've got this unused CSS guy, and if you click that, basically you get what's unused, and uh, that's all, that's a good reason to be using that. All right, then you've got to choose your browser, uh, your uh, dev tools, uh, your F12 dev tools. You've got, um, oh, you've got Chrome, Firefox, and IE. Uh, who's on uh, IE? Who's using IE for dev tools? A few half hands, oh, okay. Oh, a few more, good. Um, well, anyone on Firefox? Okay, and who's on Chrome? All right, everyone, all right. Okay, good. Well, there's a reason that you might want to be on Firefox, and that is you get uh, this cool view, and I just love this cool view, uh, and you get that. Uh, you see the layers that you've got there. You can just come in here, you click on this tools, you click on 3D view, and you've got it. So I kind of think that's kind of nice. But anyway, let's move along to what's new in 2014 and 2015. There was a whole lot of updates that came in 2013. Um, 20, uh, 20, update two, we got um, work item tagging and, um, uh, you know, and, uh, TypeScript one. Update three, we got CodeLens and App Insights bundled in, Cordova. And update four, we got uh, a whole lot of stuff in the testing space with CodeLens improvements. All right, update five, you'll see, barely had anything in it. And really, the main thing was that they wanted to make a release for uh, team project rename, okay? That, uh, that, that was uh, a long time coming, but better late than never, hey? All right. So I want to talk to you about the, the, the goodies in um, VSO. There's, uh, I'll just go through a, a number of them. Uh, my favorites being Monaco, the new build system, work item customization, um, pull requests, and App Insights. So let's have a look at that. Monaco is a good Git client. It's almost as good as Visual Studio in the browser. It's got IntelliSense and highlighting references and things like that. It's a little bit like this. Um, if, and the reason that you want to use it is sometimes, and I, and I notice sometimes people always think, oh, I have to go back to Visual Studio to make that change, especially when you're doing um, uh, problems in deployment, it's good to make a couple of changes to config files, maybe in um, sprint, uh, sprint review meetings. Uh, they just, you know, some product owners can't get past a certain thing, a couple of quick changes. Um, anyway, so let's just quickly show you how to do that. You come through here, so you browse, you press websites, um, you come over here, click that, then you click on all settings and then extensions and over here, Visual Studio Online and then we browse. Okay, so there's obviously a number of clicks to get there. That is a first time experience, and then you're in here. And then on the browser, you just come here, click views, open this guy up, um, make your changes that you want, and then refresh, oh sorry, then we have to check it in. So we come in here, click this, click this, make a comment, and then you click the save button. The save button is here. I never find that intuitive, all right. You come back here, and now you've got your dash of excitement over here. So now you can work from anywhere, like an iPad, 
and uh, that would mean even on holidays you would be able to make changes without having Visual Studio installed. All right. Okay, let's talk about build. Um, build, uh, the promise of the XAML builds was great. It was like you wanted to be able to visually read things. But unfortunately, um, this was never as easy as we hoped and you saw screenshots like this with documentation and people's uh, in developers stuff trying to explain what they're doing. When you think about the new build in 2015, who's already moved to 2015 build? Can I just get a full show of hands? There's only, not too many, okay. Well, do yourself a favor, move from XAML build to this. It's a lot easier to, to um, have a look at. I, I just grabbed um, one of our random projects and you can just read what it's doing. It's doing a build, it's running some unit tests, it's running some integration tests, it's um, you know, running some X unit tests and then it's creating an octopus release, all right? So it's, it's kind of easy to read, easy to configure and uh, they've got it done a good job. If you like Team City, uh, gee, it looks, looks similar, okay? They've had some great ideas that came out of the Microsoft um, ecosystem. So the great stuff about this is when you click on this add build step, you see all these guys and there is a lot of, there's a lot of build steps here. You know, you can uh, look, sorry, you look here, you'll see uh, things that are not Microsoft, Android, um, Ant, Maven, lots of, lots of stuff that's on the build, on the utilities, you see uh, plenty, of, plenty of stuff to run on the testing side of things. We've got um, publishing tests, Visual Studio tests, Xamarin tests, you know, lots of cool stuff. So there's a lot of, and you'll see more and more of this stuff coming. On the packaging side of things, uh, you've got NPM, NuGet Packager, and on the deployment side, well, there's Octopus, okay, and Chef. All right, so that's kind of the story, and it's much easier just running, running scripts. All right. Uh, there's been some improvements in the Scrum and Kanban side of things. We, um, we have uh, swim lanes, and it, the commenting is much nicer, so you'll have some nice... They've done plenty of stuff on the boards, and in fact, I would say that the biggest differentiator between Visual Studio Online and, um, you know, the competitors, the main ones being Jira, um, uh, Atlassian stuff is probably the biggest competitor, I guess. Uh, this stuff is uh, the biggest selling point. This has got to be the one where developers are most happy in. Uh, you can come in here and make uh, comments. Um, so this, uh, this, if you look closely, you see hash K, it starts just filtering down to words in there. So it's quite nice to be you know, making little comments as you go. Um, so what have devs done in the last year or so to avoid bugs? Well, we've done things like manual code reviews, we've done unit tests, we've tried to, and we've sorted things out with continuous integration and continuous um, builds, and if you're bold, continuous deployment. One of the best things you can do to improve your code quality is Git pull requests. And so they, if you put in your definition of done um, to uh, basically put a second pair of eyes over your pull requests, you are going to have uh, probably the best thing you can do to improve code quality. All right, so there's been a lot of investment in Git. Um, the, way, the way this works, you go new, new pull request here, sorry, new pull request, you say where you want to review changes, and you create a pull request, um, you put some comments, and then the person receives that, and then they, they have a look at what's been changed, and then they um, accept or reject. So you can make some comments. This is the workflow, you make a few comments, then you come in here and you choose whether you want to accept or reject that, all right? So, um, then you would merge it and then you're good to go. So that is a nice way of um, considering how you're going, especially with uh, junior guys. Uh, application Insights, who is using Application Insights now in their projects? Three, four, five, six, all right. Not a very large percentage, okay, or maybe uh, 10 or 15 percent. Um, who's using New Relic? 
Even less. Okay. All right. So about the same, probably. Um, having this portal on your project is pretty important. Um, you want to have a portal to quickly look at the bugs and the, how the performance of your application is going in usage. It gives you a reporting solution and it gives you lots of telemetry. Uh, Microsoft internally used stuff like this, uh, ha have been using it for years and years. Um, and uh, it's always interesting when you have conversations with Microsoft people how uh, a lot of it is based on, well, show me the data. What you're telling me is not what we see. All right. Uh, I think it improves your um, ALM life cycle. Um, and uh, it supports pretty much everything now. So that's pretty good. Uh, we have a couple of rules on this, but I want to fly through it because I want to show you some other things. But essentially what, um, uh, what you do is you just add application insights into your project. You'll get this uh, icon. You'll click that and you'll have a portal. Now this is the old portal, but I want to show you some screenshots I took on my first experience doing this. You come in here and I had a look at this and I saw the availability was 100%. Now this is just our time sheeting solution. Um, it's not a he super heavily hit application, but you know, you've got 50 people going through it daily um, because all you have to do is enter your timesheets every day and you get a free lunch in our company. So, you, you know, I'm such a generous boss. You come in here and then I had a look at this availability and uh, performance and then you see this reliability here, okay? And I thought that's interesting. So you click on this guy and you see all these um, essentially unhandled exceptions. And that is the first thing. The application might appear perfect, but it's, uh, it's under the covers. The health is not as good as it should be. So th when should you deploy that? You need to make a good time to deploy that one. And we all have different um, decisions on when we deploy. A lot of it's based on feel. Do you guys deploy in the mornings or the evenings? Who says mornings? Who says evenings? Okay, so more evenings than mornings. Um, really, it would depend on your application, okay? And the best thing to do is click on usage and have a look at this. Now, I remember having a look at this for the first time and thinking, well, there's no one entering timesheets on Saturday. It's pretty good. That's weird. There's a big spike on, you know, on Fridays. And this, what, and then you look in, in, and a lot of people were entering their timesheets at... Uh, 8.45 because they knew the report runs at 9 o'clock on Monday morning, okay? So there's a lot of people claiming uh, free lunches when they shouldn't be claiming it. And so I was able to find them. Very good. All right. Okay. So anyway, the new portal now is in um, uh, this Ibiza portal. Um, and so we come in here and we click Browse, Application Insights, go into the project, and, and it's like this. I have, a, I have a real whinge about this portal. Um, I find it a bit painful. And uh, it drives me crazy that all these are the same, uh, you know, blue, green, blue, red. But essentially, you want to be looking straight away down here. You want to be looking at all the failed requests. And if this spikes, then you want to be um, having a look at this. Um, Essentially, when you're looking at all these charts, you want your charts to be fairly similar and when you want to be explaining why this peaks. And so during a sprint review um, is a good time to at least have a look at this with the product owner just to show that not only has the PBIs we've delivered to you been great, but the health of the application underneath that you can't see is looking good too. All right. So I'm going to... Um, play you a quick, so we have these rules for better application insights. There's a whole lot of rules here on this, but there's one thing I want to play for you because I think this is a, a good little improvement that we've done in the last 12 months. Hi, this is Ben from SSW, here to talk to you about an exciting new improvement we've made to our Scrum process by including a little bit of DevOps capability by reviewing our Application Insights data. Let's check it out. Now, the first thing we have developers do is follow the pre-flight checklist. Now, traditionally, developers would normally just look to see if any unit tests are complete or and or green. Uh, but what we've done is added a couple of new things. The first thing we want developers to do is look for any new unhandled exceptions in production. 
course, these are quite important, and it's often a step developers forget to take. Uh, and the next thing we do is make sure developers take a look at any performance issues they might find in production as well. So just taking a look at the slowest pages, because sometimes there's an unexpected uh, slowness there. So the next thing we've done is slightly altered our sprint review template. For those of you who know SSW, you'll know that we have a great review template up here on our rules website, where we show the burn down, the burn up, and various other bits. But what we've done is added an application health overview image to our sprint review email as well. Now what this does is it gives the chance for developers and the product owner to sit down and review the performance of the application. And it also is a great time to talk about any uh, issues that may have impacted users in production, be it uh, an exception or uh, just a nasty bug. And there's just two really quick ways to improve your Scrum process by including some... All right. So uh, if, you, if you're thinking about DevOps, which a lot of our customers are thinking about and talking about and trying to improve, um, getting their stuff into production quicker, but also having good health, um, then uh, that type of thing, the New Relic thing or App Insights, or there's plenty of others, um, looking at that in your daily Scrum is uh, a good way to raise a bit of visibility to what's going on under the covers. All right. So let's talk about what's new in 2015. All right, the biggest user gripe was sorted out. You know what it was? Capital letters, you're on the money. So 2,000, 3,000 votes were wasted on that. And actually another 2,000 votes. I always find this amazing, because you've only got 10 votes. Why would you waste it on this? But people do. And um, that is what we had. And bingo, this is what we have now. All right. Is there anyone happy about this? Okay, there's very, just a few noisy people. All right. Okay, I thought it was just Kiwis entering all this. I couldn't work it out. Anyway, so um, I wonder, the next, you know, the next, they do one of these, it's either black and white or all caps. This time they didn't change the icon just to annoy us. So there's a whole lot of people really pissed off that the icon for Visual Studio 2015 is the same as 2013. You know, they only do that as a joke just to annoy you, you know. <laughs> All right. So, does that annoy anyone here? Put your hand up if you're really upset by it. Yeah. Three people, let the record state. Okay. All right, so let's go through a few goodies in 2015. There's lots in there. I want to talk about Roslyn, some new language features, some refactoring stuff, code lens, smart unit tests, uh, Windows 10, and shared projects, and IntelliTrace. Let's go through that. So, Roslyn is probably, in my opinion, the biggest thing in 2015. And we've got a new compiler. Uh, there's lots of... Um, uh, it, it was actually meant to be released in 2010. Uh, they didn't make it. And then 2012, they still were adding some more functionality. Uh, when it, 2013, they escaped. And that was never going to not ship in 2015. So, it's a very mature, it's a very mature product. And it's uh, lightning fast. Um, the best thing about it is all the extensions that are going to start coming, okay? It's, if you look at code um, analysis, code lens, um, stuff like that, you, all that refactoring stuff is going to, you know, we, we, re we rely on ReSharper, but ReSharper had to build their own type of engine underneath to do stuff that Roslyn can do now. So uh, we have a little tool called Code Auditor, and uh, that really helped us because we had a hell of a lot of pain with Code Auditor. Well, the main pain that we had was not the UI and stuff. It was that we'd written all the rules in regexes. And if you know much about regexes, and we try to solve this with lots of uh, nice rules on commenting re regexes and things, but it still gave developers a headache, and nobody wanted to ever fix them. Um, it's very hard when you're talking about string pattern matching. But if you look at the new one, you know, basically you, um, you get your source code and you're manipulating like you would with um, the DOM and it's a lot easier to debug. So that has been great for us. Um, there's, I'm not going to walk you through this, but I've got a couple of videos in the slides. I actually have 400 slides. So we're not going to do every single slide today, but I've put a lot of material there that you can have a look at. Um, this guy, the guy that's in charge of SSW Code Auditor, has done a couple of videos, but the main thing I wanted to show you was um, if you start, you know, you want to add some ad hoc business rules in, you want to write an extension, you want to do something like that, 
uh, you've got this Roslyn Syntax Visualizer, okay? And Roslyn Syntax Visualizer allows you inside here to have a look at the line using space system, and you've got that guy. Um, and then it obviously gets more complicated when you start looking at real things. Uh, and you've got um, your DGML here to visually have a look at the code that you're highlighting, okay? So it's, it's quite, um, it's, uh, we've had some real good success with it. And it, um, it allows you to do a couple of things. I might, uh, it's, it's got, um, you can put it in your own standalone product. I, I've got a little example of this. You've, you can use C Sharp scripting now and I'll just show you one thing. They need to, there's a couple of things they should do, improve their documentation, user voice site. Um, and there's a great video here with um, Daniel Malik interviewing Anders Holzberg. But a nice little, a little example here is Octopus. And if you have a look here, I notice this little guy. So you can write your scripts for Octopus in PowerShell or they've put C Sharp. And what that does is that allows, um, you know, PowerShell is great, but a lot of developers find that a, another big hurdle and they're familiar with C Sharp. So that type of thing, you can copy that idea that Octopus did and do it in your own applications um, and using this um, script CS. Uh, actually, Paul Bauer from um, Brisbane is one of the, the key guys in it. All right. So they, uh, I, I find this uh, amazing when I look at Roslyn and I look at, I took this uh, screenshot a few months ago when I put these slides together. To, uh, 1100, sorry, 111 packages to 200,000 downloads, all right? And then I took this new one last night. Um, look, we're almost at 2 million. So the growth is just phenomenal with um, um, Rosalind. I just think it's amazing to see that growth in several months. All right, anyway, um, you also have this, um, if you want, you can look at um, their nightly builds if you want updates more frequently. And I think a way of seeing whether something is maturing is how recently they're um, updating. Like, you can see when I took this screenshot a few months ago, they were updating regularly, and now it's multiple days between um, uh, feeds out to my get. Anyway, I just like that because I think if you guys are making new get packages yourself, you can um, publish them up to new get, but the you know, the nightly builds, you can use MyGet the same way those guys do it. Just think it's quite good. All right. So let's talk about a few new language operators. Um, there is question mark dot, okay? And that allows you to say, if not null, then do this. And of course, our code is a bit neater. All right, so you can do it like the old way or the new way. How many people are already doing it like the new way? Okay, just a, a quarter. Okay, anyone disagree with this? Don't like it? Not a soul. Okay, great, all right. So um, what's wrong with this code? Um, because I had a question when I last showed this and they said, um, is this thread safe? Can you, use, can you use this syntax and is it thread safe? I um, did a little bit of Googling and basically you... Um, uh, you need to be careful about this because you can clobber um, other people's uh, uh, changes. And so, um, so it's thread safe and that is the old code and that is the new code. All right, so it's just much neater. All right. All right. Um, some other language features, uh, auto property initializer, I'll just go through that. Uh, this is what we had in 2013. So you don't need it to declare constructors just to set defaults now. You can do it just like this. And that is substantially nicer. All right? All right. So uh, who is already doing that? Okay. Uh, anybody not like this and they're going to keep co coding the old way? One. One. And he looks pretty old, so don't worry. Okay. <laughs> All right, okay, so, uh, so we've got uh, declaration expressions. This was in the beta, but uh, they've not shipped it, okay? But it's likely you will get things. Anyway, there's lots of cool stuff up there. What you'll see 
is they've put a big list up on um, GitHub. You can see all the things coming. They're very transparent. It's really pretty awesome. Okay. So, um, so now you can write, the, if you take advantage of all this stuff, you can write things with 50% less code and you should be 50% more efficient and ship 50% faster. Okay. Got that from the Microsoft marketing materials. Okay. All right. Um, in 2008, we got Link. I mentioned this because like, I don't work in the Java world, but I often am talking to Java guys, and they always give me the impression that um, they're some light years ahead of us. And <laughs> I thought it was hilarious when I found out they only just got Link. Um, but one thing that we've always had the problem with is this guy. Expression cannot contain Lambda expressions. Okay? And there's a new feature, or a bug fix, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and uh, we have this. All right. Anyway, all right. So let me just fly through a little bit of this. Uh, there's lots of refactoring things in there. Um, they got this idea of light bulbs, and they put light bulbs around the place, and they now show you these things. It's amazing some of the things Microsoft think of. Um, but it's not ReSharp, it's Visual Studio. <laughs> and <laughs> there, there's, I, I really like uh, all these previews. There's a lot of it, and there's a lot more coming. In addition, I'm not going to tell you that you don't need ReSharper anymore, but um, there is, I just love all these code previews everywhere. Um, one of the guys in our office, Eric, loves this feature. And, and when he sent me these screenshots, I couldn't even work out what the difference was. I'm looking, I could not figure it out. What is the difference? And he just loves this color in these tooltips. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? All right. So there's more. And he actually sent me about 10 screenshots, but I only put two in. All right. So. These days you can um, use Code Rush or ReSharper, but I will tell you, because of all that Roslyn stuff, um, not only Script CS, you're going to see all these potentially ReSharper killers. There's already this, um, this one out called VS Refactoring Essentials. Um, uh, these are uh, some German guys, and these guys are some Brazilian guys, and they have some pretty good stuff, and there's actually plenty more. So there's great stuff out there. Uh, and they don't cost anything, all right? Although ReShop is probably worth uh, a few hundred bucks. Code Lens is another cool thing. That's my fourth favorite thing in there. And um, uh, that, um, uh, well, basically, it gives you a nice view over your source history and sees activity that's going on. Um, obviously, works in Git and TFS. There is PEX improvements. Now, we've been um, trying to improve our code coverage for a long time. And developers typically just don't bother. Who's, um, is anyone here practicing uh, test-driven de development, TDD? Come on, put your hands up. Just a few. OK, all right, that's good. So there's a few hands there. Um, uh, essentially, even if you're increasing your test quality, your code coverage, you don't know if it's um, good quality or wh whether you should be putting in, you know, assertions here or there. Um, we now have this feature called IntelliTest. Now, IntelliTest, um, automatically, by using it, you're going to be increasing your code coverage. But the best thing about it is when you look at code like this, can anyone spot the problem? Who can spot the problem? Not being used? Maybe. No else? Crashing, a crashing piece of code. And it's not the um, it's not their salaries. <laughs> Although the director is paid too much. Yeah, you no, know, you're right. So if, if you didn't know, and obviously a lot couldn't spot it that quick, you can especially if it's not code you've written. You can right-click on this, go Smart Unit Test. Um, you'll see an error here. And you go, oh, hello there. We got a null reference exception. So we'll add a check on there. You'll come back. You'll add a check. Um, and then you'll rerun that, and you'll see all green down here. All right? So 
That's a, an obvious, and if you really just wanted to, you know, you don't care about any of this stuff, you just want to get your numbers of your code coverage up, you can right click on here and go save as unit tests. Okay, wouldn't that be great? All right. Okay, so that's pretty cool. That's, uh, I just want to call out, just in case it's not clear, I don't want you to start thinking, oh, I saw this cool feature, you don't need to write unit tests anymore. Okay? Um, in fact, there was such a hoorah on, all, on the internal MVP groups because Microsoft Marketing were going to call it smart unit tests. Um, it came from, obviously, the marketing department who makes some strange decisions sometimes. Um, but there, uh, there was a lot of the MVPs wanted to call it dumb unit tests. But I don't think that got through marketing, so they, they renamed it to IntelliTests, okay? Which is kind of a nice name. All right. So uh, I, won't throw, I won't go through this too much, but I just think the story for Windows 10, now we've got it, is uh, a good story. We, we have the ability now to be creating um, universal apps that go well beyond just um, uh, a Windows phone and a, um, and a store app. Essentially, you can now theoretically start making some serious um, applications that go across Xbox and Surface Hubs and HoloLens and, you know, and if you add in Xamarin into the mix, you can be targeting um, six or seven platforms in a go. So that story, when we start getting this, um, you know, solidified and, and it's pretty much getting right there, um, I've got the, the new band, uh, you know, making these little things, uh, great. In fact, and you know the best thing about the band? There's a few. The best thing about the band is that um, you can turn your phone on to vibrate forever. I, I, I often hear developers whinge about people that they work with having loud, loud ringtones. They give them hints, but they don't take the hints. Um, is anyone here permanently on vibrate? Never turn it off vibrate. Okay, there's a good, good percentage there. All right, so I, I have found that a lot of people don't like that because they miss a call, okay? Especially girls with, with things in their um, phones in their purses or... Um, when you're walking along the street and it's quite noisy, you don't feel the vibrations in, on your phone. But this one always vibrates, and I find it absolutely awesome. Now, what I, what I don't like about it, I still have the Fitbit, if you notice. The, the reason I like the Fitbit is it gives you more steps. It gives you... <laughs> it sounds stupid, but... It <laughs> gives you a thousand extra steps every day, where the other one is just not counting all my steps. But the... <laughs> But the sleep app, the sleep app is amazing. So much better than the Fitbit sleep app. Yeah. Anyway, how do we go into that topic? All right. Anyway, so uh, shared projects and P, you know, use portable class libraries all the way. Don't get into the, all these discussions about not using portable class libraries and using shared pro projects. Um, how do you find slow code? Well, often what we do is we... Um, Oh, well, we kind of leave it till after. We go and get tools like Ant and, you know, the customer's complaining about the performance and we look through and try to find fat methods and fat SQL and um, that's always good. But if you're, if you're using 2015, you have this thing called Perf Tips. Um, it comes from the little um, IntelliTrace guys um, that added IntelliTrace to Visual Studio and now it, they're, they're doing some really nice stuff. As you're coding, as you're stepping through, you're seeing the performance, and you go, oh, hello there, that's an expensive call. What's going on there? That's, I think that's, um, it's a really nice piece of visibility. Um, you can then click on it and get even more information. So you can click on that. Now, let me just show you, because I, I just want to call out to you, a lot of people, when they were, you know, the only thing they knew about IntelliTrace was it was slow, and then they would come in here, and one of the tips all over the web is turn this thing off, and things will be faster. Well, IntelliTrace in 2015 um, became invisible, so there's no reason to turn that off. Uh, plus, not only is it basically invisible in terms of performance, um, in terms of functionality, there's a lot of stuff in there. You can be stepping through your code, and now you've got these tools here. And, um, you know, if you look at this, and you see it's you know, slow, you can look at, 
um, memory or CPU, and you know, well, it's not a CPU issue, there's some memory issue going on here. If you look at this debugger events, and if you want to fine tune what you're looking at over here, you can get closer and say, look, I just want to look in this, you know, this tiny window here, and I want to look down here, you can see, um, well, I've got some exceptions here, wow, I didn't realize, you know, ex exceptions are expensive, I can start getting rid of those things. Okay, I think that's quite nice. In addition, you can hover over these diamonds and you're seeing your, the stuff that you'd see in your output window. So it's, uh, it's quite a nice thing. I think uh, it'd be great to start seeing more use of this. All right. All right. Um, I will move... I'll just... What, what else have I got here? Oh, yes, I'm going to teach you about WSDL. My, my main point was, obviously, you should all be using the web API, but there's, you should be focused on your, um, your REST APIs now. It's um, pretty important. We have this URL for Microsoft, visualstudio.com slash integrate. This is going to become very, very important. Um, and uh, I just want to say, I often see the way developers document it, it's always different. You know, everyone's rolling their own documentation for their REST APIs. There's a really nice way of doing it. Swagger, okay? If you can't remember it, it rhymes like with Mick Jagger. I've got little girls, I have to listen to that stupid song quite a bit. Um, so this Swagger thing is uh, a beautiful way of just quickly making consistent documentation for your um, REST services. And uh, it's here, but the most important thing is a .NET developer, you need to grab it. So what I thought they would um, make it, they, uh, this is kind of what it looks like, and I thought that they would release something like nSwagger or something, or swagger.net, but the tool is called Squashbuckle. Okay, so Squashbuckle is the thing you need to document your REST services. Okay, and um, that is a really important NuGet package to grab and, and document. How many people are all over Swashbuckle already? Okay, yeah, almost a dozen. Okay, that's good. All right, so let's talk about ASP.NET 5. ASP.NET 5, all right. Uh, I'll just very um, quickly tell you that I know that most of you coming to tech and sit, sit in this category here, but there's a whole lot of people out there that won't pay for developer tools or conferences. And um, we've had Express for a while. It didn't have extensions. It was, um, uh, in my mind, a bit of a flop, but obviously there was uh, a million developers uh, based on Microsoft Steps using all that stuff. Um, but it wasn't everywhere. But what they did, uh, and, and if, in my mind, it failed because of the extensions. But all I really want to make sure that you guys know is this um, Express is gone, and and Scott Guthrie did this big blog post about what they were doing, and essentially what you're going to find now is the community edition, you'll see so many extensions start coming out because you can give them for free. Um, a lot of other non-Microsoft communities will start using um, Visual Studio when they have beautiful um, extensions for that. In addition, uh, if they don't want that, they can obviously use VS Code. Now, um, I want to um, also, oh, where am I? Uh, I just want to talk to you about Owen. Oh, oh, that's smart. Ah, surface book problems. Now, I'm gonna, who can I blame for this? Battery doesn't last very long, does it? All right, one second. Oh, I can't even, there is no battery port on this thing. <laughs> All right, there we go. I was just giving you a demo of um, the notifications you get in Windows 10 when you don't have power. You know the worst thing about this service book? I keep, uh, I have this paranoia, I'm gonna lose this stupid thing, this pen. I, like it sticks on the side, but um, I'm always frightened I'm gonna lose it because there's no place to put it. Anyway, I shouldn't complain, should I? 
Anyway, gee, that's a lot, good, a lot better. My screen is very bright now. Fantastic. Anyway, all I want to do was talk to you about um, ASP.NET 5. It um, supports OWIN. Um, the main thing about it is it's much lighter, okay? Um, you've, your startup, everything's changed about it, but your startup CS now has um, uh, just your services, your routes, and your features, and authentication. And what happens is the requests come through, and not everything goes through the pipeline. So you've got user identity and static files, and then you've got MVC. So if you think about a normal um, page that comes through, an MVC request will come through, it'll get verified, and then it will, if it's not a static file, it's going to go on to use MVC. Now, the good thing about it is all the resources that aren't MVC pages, like an image or you know, something like that, they come through, and they, they're an image. They, uh, they can skip this uh, check because they're anonymous, and then they can just uh, you know, return the file, and they don't need to go through this whole MVC pipeline. So that's the main advantage. If you start using ASP.NET 5, which is in beta, which is, it's in the box in Visual Studio 2015, it's just um, not RTM, okay? But uh, that is something you should be starting to think about. It's got some really nice um, uh, actions. I do want to mention to you, you, you get a couple of, you get a couple of choices whether you're going to use um, uh, whether you're going to use uh, 4.51 or 5. Um, essentially, we've been we've gone both ways on some projects. Um, I think we're happy to go with uh, 4.51 because we're happy to deploy to a Microsoft server, and it's a lot easier. Uh, if you go. If you really want to go for deploying to non-Microsoft machines, which might be a requirement, just know the developers are going to be in for a little bit more pain, okay? Because of all the um, uh, all the libraries that you use just aren't as as ready. Okay, obviously Angular is taking off like lightning; it's absolutely crazy. And um, we've we've put up on our site a whole series of videos on Angular. There's all these uh, awesome dudes. We've put up a, a series of different videos with different guys. Um, and all that material is up there for free. But the good stuff in 2015, Microsoft have gone ahead and given a lot of support to Angular. Angular 2 is going to be huge. Um, there is uh, built-in templates in the basically file new. Um, here we go. Here, is, here are your Angular templates. I think that's a, if you're not, uh, if you're not starting, uh, if you're not seriously considering this for all new projects, then you're probably crazy, if you ask me. Um, Angular 2 is all written in TypeScript, so that's pretty important. Uh, SignalR hasn't really changed, all pretty good, pretty important to continue to use. Um, all right, what else have I got here? Uh, you can do link in JavaScript. Um, like this, but I, look, I would tell you that all this type of cool stuff in ECMAScript 6, you, yes, it's very nice to do it, but as long as you're doing TypeScript, I don't think it really matters, okay? So I would just go with TypeScript. Who is doing everything in TypeScript? Can I get full hands? Because I'm only seeing a couple. Three or four. All right, I'm going to tell you that's probably the most important thing that I can tell you today, do everything in TypeScript. Um, I went to ComBank, and I remember, like, they've got, you know, a lot of developers there. And one of the reasons when you have such an enormous code base is taking on something like TypeScript is an enormous overhead to start doing. But if you can just do it piecemeal, bit by bit by bit, and you can, you can just put in your definition of done that when you touch a new JavaScript file, that you are going to do that in TypeScript, okay? So you just start changing from, you know, JavaScript JS files to TS files. All right, it's probably the best thing you can do for, you know, the, uh, making your JavaScript less fragile. All right. Okay. Okay, let me just, all right. So basically, say goodbye to ASP.NET 4, use ASP.NET 
.NET 5, but you'll have no web forms, no VB.NET. It's faster, cheaper hosting on Linux, uh, or you could use Mac for hosting. I've never heard of anyone doing that. Um, <laughs> must be very expensive. All right, so what's changed in ASP.NET 5? Um, Project.json, uh, config.json, uh, all your JavaScript packages are different. You're going to be using NPM and Bower and Grunt, okay? This is very different from what Microsoft would do in the old days. In the old days, Microsoft would reinvent these guys. Um, uh, there's a good, good example, NUnit. Microsoft could have endorsed NUnit, but what did they do? They made MS test, all right? So it's got dependency injection, API controller is controller, um, OWIN is, um, is your startup class, and um, there's compiler head, no need to compile. All righty, cool, okay. So I want to um, move on, and I want to just, I want to fit in just a couple more things. I'm going to, oh, Power BI, I just want to mention this because it's probably um, one of the best things that Microsoft have released for many, many years, especially in the, P in the BI space. Um, I have a full-on session on Power BI uh, in a, on Thursday, but for a, I just want you to be aware that they have a beautiful portal, they have a nice way of asking intelligent questions um, just by natural language, but the, the key thing is this Visual Studio Online integration. So you can go um, and there is a package on powerbi.com. You choose Visual Studio, you, um, you'll get an automatic dashboard out of it and you'll see a lot of insights into all your source control and work items and stuff. So you get a whole series, and this is the out of the box report and you can change all that. You can ask questions, all change sets, and then it'll start suggesting bits and pieces. Um, you can, um, uh, well, basically, it will auto, it'll auto create reports. Like, you spend a lot less time making reports and more time um, structuring your data and, and getting things out of it. So it's not as fussy as um, reporting services. So the ability to create your own widgets and reports are really good. It's really awesome. Now, I want to talk about the state of Scrum and DevOps because it's an important thing. Um, one of the we released this um, PDF ages ago, some years ago, and it's the most popular down PDF downloaded on our site. And in the last 12 months, we've spent a fair bit of time looking at um, uh, improved exception logging, definition of done, automated testing, health check. I just want to just uh, focus on this seeing spikes. And I kind of mentioned this to you before. Um, that pre-flight checklist is a great way of improving that cycle that you've got there. And so I've done a new poster and I've put all this stuff about DevOps in there. So I've got a couple of things here and uh, yeah, so I've, I've printed out uh, a couple of hundred of these posters so you should be able to grab some new posters if you want to put it into your, um, uh, you, you want to just have some documentation for your product owners and stuff like that. All righty. All right, how to fix bad smells in code. This is one that Microsoft haven't sorted. This is something for us to still work on. I expect in the next year, this is um, an area that things are gonna solidify. So the state of testing at the moment, I guess you write your own tests and you can write your tests, your unit tests in X unit or N unit. We, at SSW, we mainly use probably N unit, I guess. Um, although X unit is just as, um, well, it, it might end up being the dominant one, but if you, if you compare X unit and N unit, they're pretty close to each other. In terms of the UI testing, if you're talking Windows forms and, and things, code UI tests are pretty much the, the way to go. Or you can do um, on the web, Selenium and Chutzpah. I've been corrected, I was calling it Chutzpah, but it's actually Chutzpah. Okay, I don't know why the C is not, they should have just deleted the C and then we'd all pronounce it right. Okay, anyway, selenium and chutzpah, and actually I think that's wrong, it's meant to be a chuk, but I'm not very good at it. chutzpah. Um, I think they're the way to go for most .NET developers. Um, we, I, you know, 
this is a very evolving landscape and most developers, even uh, serious JavaScript front-end developers, uh, haven't really nailed this uh, front-end testing for uh, JS unit, Q unit, Mocha, Jasmine and Chutzpah. We kind of lean towards Jasmine and Chutzpah, okay, but it's early days. Um, I do want to talk to you about um, technical debt as well. So, yeah, X unit is first class citizen. In there, it's all in, there's Chutzpah, I've just talked about it, but basically the way Chutzpah works, which is really nice, Chutzpah, um, is you have your tests, you go and install an extension called Chutzpah with a C, and uh, then you right click and go run J JS tests. Okay, you run that and then you'll see all your tests pass. All right, so this is, I think this is great and you should be thinking about it. The other thing I want to talk to you about is technical debt. Now, we believe, um, we believe in running continuous integration, right? I think everybody here would be having a CI story, I hope, okay? Now, so essentially, what you're t wouldn't it be good if we saw beautiful stats on our code? Now, the stats like this, you can go into any project and run what, we've got an analyze menu in Visual Studio, we can run, you know, run code metrics over it and have a look. But really, what you want is you want a nice set of um, information that you're always looking at. So, your, your continuous integration is always checking your code compiles and, and your passing tests. But how about from here on in, we start continually analyzing our code for technical debt? And we start seeing each sprint whether the code, we're delivering our PBIs, but is it healthy? Is the stuff in our, and, and really that's why you want something like Sonar Cube or some way to continually be looking at your technical debt in it. Okay, I think that's an area uh, in, in our health. To get that, you go into um, build and you, you can grab these guys, Sonar Cube for MS Build. And um, that's the way you can set that up and then you've got that. that that's, well, that's just one example of a good story. Okay. So anyway, this year I recommend MVC, um, Web, Web API, TypeScript, and Angular. Um, I would say go with the SPA front end often, a Web API back end, using App Insights daily with DevOps. Um, your mobile story, well, um, I will generally say yes to Xamarin, no to Xamarin Forms, um, but the easy way is just having a you know, responsive UI. And you wanna sort out your continuous deployment story, um, ideally to Azure, I'm a much bigger fan of, um, a bigger fan ever of Azure after working on a, a large project and we had to deploy to, um, la you know, there was 40 large companies around the world and the only companies we didn't really have any, well, the ones we didn't have any pain with was the ones that went with Azure. The rest of them put, um, put our poor client through a lot of pain and a lot of expense. Um, the testing stuff we've talked about that's important and the technical debt story. Now we've done a new PDF, you can download it's free, it's a Visual Studio 2015 checklist. Uh, we have an Angular one as well. Um, I do want to tell you about a, a really, um, the best thing that you can do. Now I have special permission to play this video. Um, the, this is, um, there is going to be a launch in, on Thursday at 2 a.m., all right? So the condition is, if you want to watch this video, you have to get up at 2 a.m. on Thursday and watch the Connect launch in New York, where you're going to see um, a massive amount of stuff out, out from Microsoft, which um, we would all love to tell you everything about it, but I'm going to give you a little taste of what is coming, okay? What do, what do you think that is? A, a store. Okay, let's have a look at this. Hi guys, Ben Pell from SSW here. Now I've been working with Visual Studio for quite a while now, and I'm super excited to show you guys how to build your own extensions. So let's go check out just how easy it is. So the first thing we're gonna do is head over to visualstudio.com slash integrate. And we're gonna check out the extensions overview. And this gives you a great tutorial about what you need to do to get up and running, uh, building a new, but what you'll find is the first one took me about 45 minutes to fire up and it's just because you need to know a lot of Node and a bunch of OpenSSL stuff and there's just a lot of moving pieces here to get up and running. 
Now what I've done is created a Yo Man generator, which brings the whole process down to about two minutes. It's super great, let's go check it out. Now if you haven't seen Yo Man before, it's basically a file new project generator that lets you spin up you know, new projects and new files very, very easily from the command line. Go and install it here using npm. And specifically, we're gonna look at the generator-vsts-extension module, which is I've created, which you can go install here and run using your VSTS extension. So once you have all that installed, jump over to a uh, Explorer window here, just type in PowerShell in the, uh, at the top and it'll fire. Did you see that? I never knew you could do that. He went into the, <laughs> I couldn't believe that. I've wasted too much of my life opening this and then navigating to the right folder. He just went into, I'll just go back, it's just in case you didn't. <laughs> Play that again. Explore a window here, just type in PowerShell in the, uh, at the top and it'll fire one up. He went straight to the folder. All right, is that a hot tip? Maybe I should have already known that. <laughs> Who thinks that's a hot tip? Oh, look at that. Everybody, except Richard Banks. Yes, oh, even Richard, all right, cool. And from here we can type in yo vsts extension. It's gonna fire up this happy little dude and we're gonna say this is called vsts demo. Now this has gone and created the file new project for us. As you can see here are all the files you need and everything is configured already. Now I've gone and pumped this brand new file new project up to the uh, extension marketplace. Here you can see new extension. I've shared it with my account. And if you go over and look at my account, just by going to any one of the projects, you can see what's happened with this extension. It's gone and added a new hub at the top here, new hub group, and it's gone. So isn't that amazing? Absolutely amazing, hey? I'm just amazed. <laughs> now these extensions from Microsoft are some of the greatest product integrations I've ever seen from them. They offer up so much opportunity for developers to add their own functionality directly into visualstudio.com. In fact, I've been working on SSW Time Pros extension and it's gonna allow time sheeting uh, application functionality to be had directly inside of visualstudio.com. Now, if you'd like any more tutorials on how to build your own extension or just great tech videos in general, head over to tv.ssw.com and you'll be able to find it. All right, so who was impressed with that story? We are gonna get the ability, uh, hopefully Aussies are going to produce all the extensions we need in the world. That would be amazing, all right, since you're first to know about it, all right. Great, so um, we did a bit of a trip down memory lane in the beginning, we talked about what's new in 2014 and 2015, we spoke about um, ASP.NET and uh, a whole lot of testing things. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, three things, uh, you can come up here and get a bag, I have a whole series of bags. In these bags, we have um, those posters that, we, that I just showed you and some um, 8 gig USB drives. So grab those. They fit nicely in your wallet like a business card, so they're pretty cool. Um, we have a whole series of uh, videos on tv.ssw, so uh, you can grab some of those. And if you're cool, you want to see, you want to start thinking about coming to NDC in Sydney, which I'm so glad that those. Norwegians have come out and uh, they're running their conference. It's a real fun conference. I did it in Norway. Thank you guys.